Hello, welcome to our Sunday Science Q&A and this one is, uh, well I always find them very exciting and a lot of fun and I'll just tell you right from the start if you would like to send in questions and we can cover a lot of ground. When I say we, me, almost no ground whatsoever. Helen, an enormous amount of ground as I'm sure people who've been watching over the last year will know. Um, we're particularly talking today uh, about, about geology, ideas of geoscience. Uh, this is, if you listen to the most recent Infinite Monkey Cage, which was a lot of fun to do uh, because it was one where you could see Brian was getting tetchy because he was worrying there wasn't enough science in it because he was uncertain. I would say almost cynical towards the importance of when trying to work out what kind of stone a stone Stone is just giving it a little chew, uh, which is what Susie Maidman uh, suggested and Chris Jackson. And uh, so he had that. had one of his kind of, you know, oh, I don't know if this is proper science, it's all particles. That's all great, but it's all got too big. So that was fun. Um, so we, if you've got any questions based on the back of that show as well, which really was a tremendous a joy because people were so excited. Uh, it was a, a really excitable panel in, in the best possible way. So if you've got questions, you can send them in to uh, either just put them in the live chat uh, and Trent will make sure that I know about those. Trent is our producer if you just joined us for the first time or you can just tweet us at cosmic shambles as well uh tell you a few things that we're up to at the moment we've got a new series on cosmic shambles that has just begun uh which is called tips for existence where i talk to uh scientists and academics and artists about kind of different ideas of finding some sense of meaning uh or purpose in what many people would consider to be a meaningless and purposeless universe and i talked to brian green who has just written a, or just coming out in paperback a wonderful book called until the end of time and uh that was that was this week's that's just gone out. Brian of course, has written many other books as well and is a, a mathematician and a physicist and sometimes. Um, this week's one, which goes out on Tuesday, is Nicole Stott, who is uh, an engineer, an astronaut and an artist, which in a different order would almost be the, you know, the Pink Panther theme, but it's not. Um, but she's Nicole is fantastic. She spent, I think it was, a, I think it was 100. 13 days in space i might be out a couple of days uh but she started off as an engineer and uh, that is on this tuesday and if you are a patreon supporter and i hope some of you are because it makes a huge difference at the moment because obviously for people like me still not back on tour and that is how i used to make my living uh and for all of us uh, a lot of the stuff we did was funded previously by the live shows where, which we made money for to make these so if you can support us that's great if you are a patreon supporter tomorrow at 4 p.m i'm talking to carlo rivelli and carlo rivelli is one of i think the greatest science writers he writes with such a beautiful a deep understanding which is also attached to such a wonderful poetry of our understanding and attempts to understand the universe and his new book Helgoland uh, which is about quantum mechanics is is absolutely wonderful so I'll be talking to him at 4 p.m if you're a patron supporter that's live and of course Uncanny Hour continues and next week's episode will include Stuart Lee and Alan Moore uh, and Priya Satrajan talking about the nature of evil from the perspective of a quantum physicist because that's the kind of thing we like to do with horror documentaries so i hope you enjoy that anyway let oh, oh there's another one as well trent told me to remind you about brain yapping which is uh rachel england as well and uh, the most recent one was about fight or flight mechanisms i think we did seven shows in about the last seven days uh so we're trying to make as much as possible uh and as i said today we are going to be talking about, about geoscience send in your questions um let's start off with you helen um now, Helen, I know you've had a uh, you've had an exciting week, haven't you? Looking at uh, idiosyncratic canals. Oh yeah, so, oh, yeah. My, so week my week started with a jug exploding, which was genuinely exciting, which is to do with tempered glass and what happens when you drop things on it. Not, it's 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 definitely exciting. It's not generally recommended, I would say. I tweeted some pictures if you're that curious about that. It did explode everywhere properly, um, and then I got to go to I got ought to go all the way to Leighton Buzzard to film some educational material for the BBC. Which and it turns out that sitting in a white box um, in Leighton Buzzard is actually quite exciting in the middle of lockdown. So that was my I felt very lucky, and I got to investigate their canal, which unlike all other canals I've ever met, which is which is straight because a canal goes from here to there. They have a canal that was a river i think they've turned it into a canal um so yes i got out this week so i'm i'm basically i my cabin fever is even worse than it was before because now i have seen the outside i've seen it i know it's there your it's suitcase worse. has the that that stamp on it saying latent buzzard now in those wonderful <laughs> journeys that you've made i'm just going to mention one other thing actually before we 
presume you have a, a this week in science do, history yes. for us. I was just going to mention because I know something we didn't tell the panel beforehand is uh, you will often not be on screen uh, when other people are talking. So don't worry about looking overly interested. What's happened is you don't know this at home, but I've seen people I've realised they've got the face on which goes, I think I'm still being looked at. So I need to really look like I'm extremely excited by this particular bit of news. But you're fine, everyone else. You're not currently on screen. There we go. That's a little bit behind the scenes, isn't it? Helen, tell me about this week in science history. So this week in science history, so I'm going back here to 1894, and it's a paper that seemed very obscure at the time. And it's interesting both because of the paper and because of the reaction to it. Um, it was a paper that was called, and I'm going to uh, read it out because it's got a very good title, um, an experimental investigation of the circumstances which determine whether the motion of water shall be direct or sinuous. And then it carries on a bit. But basically, this is a, written by a guy called Osborne Reynolds back in uh, 1894. And he was looking at in pipes, sometimes water flows as though it's like if you imagine thick honey flowing, it flows very slowly and it's like layers that just kind of flow over each other. But if you imagine pouring water down a pipe, there's loads of turbulence and the water is kind of um, whizzing around in lots of different directions. And that's what he means by whether the water flow is direct or sinuous. And he basically did a huge number of experiments in pipes and he looked at what has to happen in terms of how viscous the fluid is. Could you imagine honey flows nice and slowly? You don't often see um, honey doing exciting things. Um, and he did all these experiments. And actually, my book, the, the title Storm in a Teacup, it's relevant to that because when you pour milk in a teacup and you see it swirling around, that's a turbulent situation, um, but it's got a little bit of structure and you see some of the same things in weather. Anyway, so he wrote this paper, he did all these things, and what he found is there's a relationship between, which sounds very obvious to us now, that there's a relationship between how thick the fluid, like how viscous the fluid is, how big the space is and how fast it's moving that tells you whether it's going to flow nicely or whether it's going to be, um, you know, mixed up. And this is, um, it's really important in fluid dynamics because what he actually is talking about is this philosophy. And it's a philosophy that says, there's underlying physics which says viscosity matters more than inertia. And he came up with this number, this ratio that told you whether viscosity mattered more ratio, or, or inertia mattered more. And it's this really fundamental thing in fluid mechanics. But the reason I wanted to pick it is because history also records a letter between uh, Lord Rayleigh and um, George Stokes, who were both very famous uh, fluid physicists and fluid dynamics people. And Lord Rayleigh had obviously written to Stokes to ask him whether this paper is any good because he doesn't really understand it. And this is what uh, Stokes said. He said, I must, I must plead guilty to not having digested Professor Osborne Reynolds' paper, though much time has passed since it was um, passed on to me. So he's clearly not bothered to read it. I find it very difficult to make out what the author's notions are. As far as I conjecture his meaning, I must say I do not think he has made his point. And then he goes on and said, he's an able man, he can do this thing. And he comes to the end, he says, um, the fact that the author has gone to the expense of printing this paper shows that he himself considers it to be of much importance, although I confess I am not prepared to endorse that opinion myself, but neither can I say it may not be true. Um, so he writes this really snotty letter, basically. And um, this is between, it's just, uh, this is between two of these great physicists. And the paper that Reynolds wrote was basically, now if you teach fluid dynamics, and I do teach introductory fluid dynamics to first year students, these these ratios, these numbers that say which bit of physics is more important, they are the absolute fundamental thing in all fluid mechanics. So, and it just this is only 125 years ago, and yet these two men both entirely missed the importance of this paper, and they were both really snotty about it. And you know, he wrote his paper, and it, it came, you know, everybody else worked out that he was right, and that there's this really fundamental pattern in the universe that tells you which physics is more important. And so that's my bit of science for this week, just because um, it was really important. Uh -huh. I love this letter. Well, it's, it was the same in 1859, wasn't it? The, the presentation of uh, of, of Darwin's uh, mutation, uh, heredity, and natural selection. Now, the idea of natural selection. Was at the end of the year. No, nothing much interesting is being presented to us. And so yeah. that's a. We have, by the way, had a hundred and.
17 complaints in the last two minutes from beekeepers who have said that they're very angry with you saying that nothing very interesting has ever happened with honey. So uh, pretty angry about the honey stuff there. Um, and we'll be hearing from the beekeepers later on as well for the purposes of balance. Um, we're also joined by Dr. Anjana Katwa, who this morning you were on television. This morning on, you were on television uh, with on... Alan Titchmarsh. Love the weekend talking about fossil collecting. Now, can I check, was this spurred on by the excitement around the fact that I think the Mary Anning uh, statue is actually go and I think there's a uh, um, going to be a, a there is a film about her as well or was this as it should naturally be just natural excitement about fossil collecting well actually they, they wanted well, actually they, they wanted to film it because they wanted to encourage people to explore beautiful places once they come out of lockdown obviously once it's safe to do so so that's that's where that interest came from and where better to go than the Jurassic Coast <laughs> And was it, I mean, the, the, the excitement, do you still find themselves thinking, right, I've got a few hours, I know this beach, I'm going with a hammer and I'm going to see what I can find. Do you still get a kind of, you know, uh, a, a, a visceral thrill at those moments of discovering fascinating pieces of uh, what we, well, the Earth's architecture? Oh, I think you do. I mean, I'm, I'm just watching Twitter, watching the Twitter feed this morning, and there's people walking out on Charmouth Beach just just this morning and saying, "Look, this is what I found. I've got this handful of amazing pyrotized ammonites." And there is a real thrill. I mean, some, I would recommend obviously going on a guided fossil if you want to use a hammer. But I think generally nature does the work for you, and and you're scrabbling around in that sand, and you find that amazing piece of history and you pick it up and you're the first person to pick it up for hundreds of millions of years and I think there's something really magical magical about that yeah because I've always been told about I, I spent a day on Charmouth Beach someone said don't go there everyone goes there now all the best stuff's gone you've got to go there's another secret beach come up here come this way to the secret beaches now what have you got have you got a show and tell for us I've got a show and tell for you. Actually, a lot of my fossils are, are from, obviously from the Jurassic Coast because I live about half an hour away from the coast. This one, I found this. So I'm going to show you. This is kind of what it looked like before it was not very prepared. Um, but I, I kind of had a sense something lovely was in it. And then I had um, a friend of mine called Richard Edmonds. He took it away and he prepared it for me. And this was inside. Oh, and it's just it's just beautiful. It, it's a Zipherocerus ammonite. And what I really love about it is, in particular, is if I just, can I find where the bite mark is? There is a bite mark just there where my fingernail is. Sorry, I'll just put my head there. There's a bite mark there. And, and another fossil collector looked at it. It's Paddy Ashdown, who worked on a film with Kate Winslet. And he said, oh, that's a V-shaped bite mark. And he said, oh, well, that could have potentially been a belemnite that took a chunk out of the shell of that ammonite. And he said the way they used to feed was they, they used to suck the soft bodied creature out of the shell a bit like a, a, through a milkshake through a straw. You know, so it, it kind of had this really beautiful, gruesome story to it. And if I turn it on its side, what's really lovely is you can see the kind of the spines coming out of the shell itself. So it kind of gives you an indication of how sharp that shell would have been if it was swimming through the water. And the other thing that's really lovely about it is the coloration. So you can see um, just here where you see the gray, gray part of the fossil, that's, that's been filled in with, with the silt and the clay um, where the soft bodies obviously decayed or been eaten. And then the middle, you have those air chambers which are now filled with calcite. So there are just so many amazing stories to tell um, from one fossil. That's beautiful, wonderful, and I, and I presume if people want to see that, uh, what you did this morning as well, that's probably well, on I'm ITV. Sure there's ways of the way the technological yeah. world works. That's right. I don't ITV really know. <laughs> my, 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 my fossil hunting is just by watching talking pictures, uh, various 1940s black and white movies. Now we're also joined by movies. Professor now we're Ian also Stewart, joined by uh, Professor Ian Stewart, Stewart uh, communications uh, at the University of Plymouth. Uh, I'm going to go straight in there. What have you got for us today on your show and tell? Oh well, I thought I'd get a fossil. Well, as well. I thought I'd get a fossil as well because. Um, because I don't really study fossils, as anyone who knows me knows. But this is a this is a, an interesting one. So I don't know if you can see that. So it's a coral, uh, Porites, and it's actually enclosed around a little lump of of granite there. And the reason why I chose this, most of my rocks are in the work, and I can't get to them. But this one, I have at home because I picked this. So I know, I know when this died. This died on uh, the twenty sixth of December two thousand and four. Because it's a piece of coral that I picked up on the beach at Kaolack after the tsunami, the Boxing Day tsunami, and I was filming a few months afterwards. And, and what I really like about it is, um, you know, that, that, was a re that, was, that was probably the first time for me that I had to go to a kind of disaster zone and see the effects of stuff that I'd 
do lectures on, etc. So it was really, uh, you know, quite a seminal moment for me in terms of the way that I thought about my work. But also the other thing about it is, is just the amazing things of these these natural corals. So that for, we now use these. So corals are amazing. Many of the corals grow up to sea level and they have this intimate relationship with sea level. Um, and so we can see if the land is rising or falling. So they're starting to to uh, date these things and actually detect past earthquakes on the back of the coral records going back a thousand years. So it's kind of this way of, you know, I'm sure for Ajana too, it's, for us rocks, I mean, there is a beauty in the thing itself. It is gorgeous, but it's what, it's like a portal. It's what it takes us to. It's these stories that it tells us. In this case, it's a kind of a dark underbelly of, you know, the, the reality of earthquakes. But I think that's what I'm interested in is, is where these things take us into the past. That's beautiful. I think that's it's something we talked about a lot on that every landscape changes when you start to know the story that lies underneath it and you know talking to people where you suddenly find out in the peak district what you're actually looking at is a coral reef from when it was you know all of those and it, and it just fills your mind with so many more pictures it's, it's wonderful let's start off we've got loads of, of, of uh, brilliant questions I'm, I'm going to start with this actually because this has been every week and we've never got to it so Helen this one's for you this is from Dean Dean I'm sorry we've kept you waiting I hope you're still there uh, this is uh, your your question is important to us so please hold uh this is what happens to water under extreme pressure does it boil freeze or just stay as water uh yeah so water is funny stuff water is um, funny stuff um and it's actually very, very resistant to pressure in general so if you go down to the bottom of the mariana trench for example so sort of 11 kilometers down and and when you've when you're down there the water at the bottom has all the weight of the ocean on top of it. So if you if you imagine um, standing on the ground and looking up, and you at a, and imagine seeing a plane that's at cruising altitude, so it's about ten kilometers up, and imagine all of that distance between you and the plane filled with water, and the weight of that water pushing down on you. It is a huge amount of pressure, and the so most things if you squeeze them, obviously they get a bit smaller. Under all of that pressure, water only gets about five percent smaller. So it's basic. It's a tiny difference. It's almost incompressible. Um, so so when it when you put it under pressure, water actually doesn't change that much. What goes into it can change. You know, the amount of dissolved gas that it can hold and that kind of thing does change. But water itself changes very, very little. Um, so and I don't think anyone has really tried because it's quite hard to experimentally put water under much higher pressures than that. Uh, just because anything you do in a lab with a diamond anvil, you know, it's it's hard to get to those pressures. So I. Ultimately, all sort of solids and liquids kind of like I don't think water will become as fresh water probably won't become a solid because as you um, let me think about this, I might have to think about the details of that because water does some funny things. It's got a weird phase diagram, but basically it's probably not going to solidify under most conditions. Uh, but I would have to look that up because obviously ice expands when it freezes. So but solidifying it under pressure might not i don't know how that changes volume um so i don't know the details but basically i'm glad that you've kept dean pressure. hanging because i think if it had just <laughs> it's ended like having, it's a bit like frazier you know it was much better with <laughs> niles when you were uncertain about the relationships and in the same way you and your answer for dean we haven't got to the end of it yet you're going to have well, to stay on for a bit I'll longer more thing though which is that there's different forms of ice so if you could compress it press it enough um, there are, I think, about eight or ten structures of ice that just don't exist in the real world. They're not anywhere in the in the world that we see on glaciers or in our freezers. Um, but ice has different crystalline structures with quite different properties. And if you put it under enormous pressure, uh, you get to some of those different forms of ice. So if you could solidify it by squashing it, it almost certainly wouldn't be like the ice that we see in the freezer. It would be more dense and kind of a different crystal shape. But if you brought it out into the atmosphere, it would change so you can never see it that's the thing you could put it under pressure it would do all these interesting things but you'd never see it directly well that's a fascinating thing isn't it because water is the that we spend the most time with that we're made of that appears to be everywhere we kind of think of it as that being the way that something is that it goes in this kind of the journey that water goes and in, in fact it's you know one of the reasons that makes it rare and strange is that it, it does behave in an unusual way doesn't it 
Yeah, and also the, 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 the biggest consequence for Earth, actually, for, as for the planet, for which, the is planet which is actually re- very relevant to the geology, geology, is it takes an enormous ma- amount of energy to get water to go from ice to a liquid and from a liquid to a gas. And that energy is called latent heat. So, so the stuff itself doesn't actually change temperature. Uh, if you take ice close to the freezing point, you have to add loads and loads and loads of energy Uh, And it will become a liquid, but it's still at zero. So you just have to put energy in to make it a liquid. And that basically stabilizes our planet because it means that if we get a bit of extra energy from the sun, you can evaporate a bit of water. It's storing a huge amount of energy and it will give it back later. And the temperature doesn't change very much. So so that the latent heat of water and its enormous heat capacity make Earth a very stable place to live. So actually, it is very weird, but we wouldn't have a a habitable planet if it wasn't that weird. Yeah, of course, strange things are needed to make things as strange now, as us. Now, uh, let's go, Anjano. We, we started with Ammonite. Let's move on to Trilobite. Uh, this is uh, a question from uh, Bridget, who would like to know, what is it about trilobites that make them so abundant in terms of fossil hunting? I, I think it's the, the pres- I, I think it's the, the preservation, and that's all down to the, their kind of body structure. They have a really hard exoskeleton. So when we look at fossils and we look at the, the ones that are most plentiful, the, the best preserved fossils have really hard exoskeletons and, and these are trilobites you know you, you can see these beautiful preserved bodies of trilobites that would have been kind of fossilized at the bottom of these seabeds and they're kind of all crawling over each other and look, they just look really weird and strange but it's that I, th- I think I think you just have this remarkable coincidence sometimes of soft-bodied creatures being um, fossilized and I think one of the really leading fossil collectors that's done so much work in this er- area is Steve Etches over at the uh, Etches Collection in Kimmeridge. And you can see some of his incredible fossils like ammonite eggs. Ammonite eggs, who would have thought? <laughs> and he's, he's got a fossil which, which kind of shows that. And you can see that at the museum. But coming back to trilobites, it is simply because you've got this really hard exoskeleton that can survive that fossilization process, you know, being buried under you know, layers and layers of rock, you know, over hundreds of millions of years of time. That's why they're so successfully preserved in the record. Have they got super cool eyes? There's something about the eyes of trilobites that's weird. Yeah, I, do, I don't know too much about trilobites. About that, trilobites. Might, that might be Ian could possibly tell us about that. Because that's over at your neck of the woods, isn't it? I had a, <laughs> it's up in Scotland. Yeah, you don't get... Yeah, you have to. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was thinking of Plymouth. <laughs> well, I guess, it's, yeah, there are some, some little bits of the Devonian, but I mean, I think that's... The older stuff up north is is in the Wales and things like that. I don't know. I mean, I do remember something about some science, but I, yeah, I'm not a paleontologist. I, I've got myself in the wrong place by starting with coral, haven't I? I've, <laughs> I've led myself down my own rabbit hole here. Well, if anyone does want to know more about trilobites, if uh, you channel go- on YouTube, you'll find Robin Hitchcock, uh, one of the great natural historian singers, because he also sang the great song Ole Tarantula as well, uh, once with myself, Alan Moore and Stuart Lee as backing singers, which I don't think helped the song. Uh, but if you go, if you have a look there, there's a lovely song uh, by Robin Hitchcock all about trilobites. Let's move on. This question from Sovra, who would like to know, uh, I'll start with you on this, Ian. If, if plates have been shifting for million stroke billions, of years how can we find rocks older than that do molten rocks have the inside age of the earth are they older on surface yeah so yeah so well we for a start we don't really know when plates started moving but it probably is a few billion years that, that we've been moving around um and then the other thing that's interesting is you know the one of the key things about plate tectonics when plate tectonics emerged it was a theory that came out of the oceans and it came out of geophysics um so it was the, the investigation of the oceans that, that showed these nice simple structures of you know oceans getting bigger and and um and also subduction so all of the elements that we have in what we see is plate tectonics um but actually it doesn't work very well on the the continents and the reason for that is that the oceans are really made of one rock, basalt, and and they're really young. We don't really have any ocean crust older than 200 million years, which might seem incredibly old for people like that, but in terms of geologists, that's not really that old. But the continents are made of more of a silicic rock, granite, really, and that's a lighter rock and harder to get rid of. So when you create when you take a basalt and you mix it with water and you turn it all around, you produce something that's much more of a this silica-rich rock. 
and it doesn't like to get pushed back down into the earth. So what you end up accumulating over geological time is lots of flotsam and jetsam of granite type rocks that clump together to form the continents. So the continents get bigger and bigger and bigger. But the oceans kind of reassemble themselves. They, they, they disappear, they close, they open, they close, they open. So the oceans we've got now are relatively young and the continents we have now are really old. So what you can find is you can find slithers of little bits of ocean crust that could have, should have gone down and been destroyed, but actually managed to scrape themselves onto the continents. And they're called Ophiolites and classic places for other places like Trudos Mountains in Cyprus, or in fact down our way, down in the, um, the Lizard Peninsula, down in, uh, in Cornwall is a, a little patch of Ophiolite. So you get these, these um, yeah, little telltale signatures of past oceans stranded in the middle of continents. But it is amazing, this business, that the oceans are really quite temporary structures, more, you know, oceans, proper going oceans. And all we get in the geological record are these, these um, enigmatic little signs of past oceans. I love Brilliant. the idea of the continents just being the scum skimmed off the top. <laughs> <laughs> That'll put us in. I mean, I'm always telling people the ocean matters more. but that's... Well, here's the thing. I mean, when plate tectonics <laughs> emerges, it's say emerges in the 60s, and geologists don't like it at all. I mean, they, they really take a bit of time. So it's more or less for, for the geophysics community, plate tectonics emerges in the early 60s and is done and dusted by the late 60s. Everyone accepts it. But geologists take to the mid-70s to actually accept it. And it's because where they're working, they don't see all these nice, simple structures that you see in the oceans. They see complexity and, and all the rest of it. And plus, it doesn't really make any difference to them plate tectonics is you know why you know the rock types that are there are there so it is interesting now that we have this as our centerpiece of our, our theory but actually as i say it was a reluct very reluctant acceptance i sometimes find telling with you aggressive approach to support the oceans that you're going to end up being someone from a Guillaume del toro movie which then turns into some kind of strange angry sylph-like creature from the <laughs> oceans and i hope that is what happens because that will really help in terms of viewers when we get to the second year this um is my best innocent face <laughs> <laughs> um this is a question from neil and john i'll ask you this this is uh he says neil does a lot of walking the chiltern hills and he says he's noticed two types of rock in the soil crumbly chalk and very hard flint quite often with a beautiful purple coloring inside and what he finds interesting is sometimes he'll find one at the top of a hill others at the bottom or vice versa but it's not consistent why is this and as a uh, secondary question also say what's it that makes the flinty rocks purple inside Oh, I really like this question. Oh, I really like this question because, um, well, let's start off with chalk, actually, because I've got a piece of chalk here, and we all know what chalk looks like, so it's a, a white kind of powdery rock. Now, chalk is forming in uh, oceans, um, and in those oceans are billions and billions of these uh, algae called coccolithopores, and their bodies, their shells are, are carbonate, uh, made out of calcium carbonate, and when they die, those bodies, and indeed their detritus, kind of falls out of the water column and settles on the bottom of the seabed um, and someone that I knew a very long time ago he likened this to kind of dandruff falling through water so just imagine that so so this is how chalk is forming uh, kind of these bodies and the detritus of these algae falling through the water column settling at the bottom then at the bottom of the sea we have um, all sorts of other organisms living you know in this particular example we've got a bivalve you can probably just see that there um, but we also have other organisms like sea urchins with with spines so what's happening at the, at the bottom of this ocean is there's a chemical reaction within the water and it's actually quite an acidic environment so when these um, organisms like these sea urchins uh, die um, their bodies kind of start to become dissolved in this acidic environment and the silica begins to precipitate out of the water as, as their bodies are dissolving. Now again at, at the bottom of the seabed you've got all sorts of organisms burrowing in, in the seabed itself creating kind of like tubes if you like and this dissolved silica I, I guess the best way to describe it is like a silicious ooze so think of that like a kind of yeah gloopy kind of mixture it oozes into these burrows and over time as these rocks become buried over time uh, this silicious ooze hardens into a microcrystalline rock called flint and that deep purpley color is that is that color of the silica and where this where neil is finding these these two different rocks on its hill um, 
because we know that these burrows are, are kind of forming at the bottom of the seabed, we often see this flint, these, this kind of um, silicious ooze that's now hardened, that's become kind of hardened into this microcrystalline rock. We see that in bands in the rock. And I guess if you were to take a massive knife and, and chop that hill in half, you would see a massive wall of chalk with these bands of flint running through it. And that must be what he's kind of experiencing as this kind of chalky hill is eroding gradually, naturally over time as bits of the rock are falling out and you see bits of the flint falling out uh, out of the banded formations. So there you go, silicious ooze. Thank you so much for that term, silicious ooze. I will be writing probably going to be a ripoff of Roald Dahl and the main villain will undoubtedly be called Silicious Ooze. Um, this is a question from uh, this one for you Helen I think this is from uh, John TJ 84 and it's a question from a uh, uh, six year old which is are glaciers just big icebergs? Um, it's more the other way round. Um, it's more the other way round, actually. The icebergs are just bits of glaciers that have moved on a bit. So there are two types of floating ice in the ocean. There's the bit where the ocean itself freezes, and that's sea ice, and that kind of forms flat plates, and that's what's covering most of the Arctic Ocean. And then there's these bits where um, snow and it falls onto land, it becomes compressed, it builds up enormous layers, kilometres thick in, in Greenland and Antarctica. And then but eventually it, it is moving. It kind of flows. It's very heavy, uh, but it flows a bit like water in the long term. And lumps of that fall off. And when they get to sea, they become icebergs. And so it's a different type of ice. It's it's much more compressed. You often see these very um, beautiful blue layers in it, which is where ice has, where uh, water has melted and then refrozen without the bubbles. And you actually get to see the true colour of water, which is bright blue in a in a way that is uh, slightly disconcerting. And you also get brown bits where you sometimes got, you know, organic deposits that formed a line. So um, icebergs are made out of glacier, but they kind of they're a bit further down the process and they've been tumbled around in the ocean a bit usually, but they are more or less the same stuff. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, now this you in. This is from uh, uh, Kylie's 10 year old and her 10 year old <laughs> wants to know, does lava flow all the time under the ground? And if so, why doesn't it just leak into rivers? I hate them. I hate those questions from 10 year olds because they're always, <laughs> or four year olds, they're always the hardest questions. You know, it's funny, we've re just in the last few years, we're sort of rethinking the way that lava sits underground. You know, if you look at the classic textbook, you see these almost cave magma chambers, you know, these, and you get it in things like, um, what was the one, the Deep Impact, or, you know, the, uh, the core when they go in to the mantle and they find these things. And so, I, and so the assumption has always been that the, the stuff flows up and forms these molten pods underneath and then feeds upwards. And um, and actually, when you think about it, it doesn't really make much sense. These are it's kind of solid rock. But much more likely is that we're getting this, uh, this material is coming up, this hot semi-molten rock, and it's just feeding and sitting in cracks and sitting around waiting there. And the key thing probably to set it off isn't so much um, temperature, it's probably pressure. So it's depressurizing something at the surface. So it could be like Mount St. Helens when you have a landslide or something to do with an eruption, or it could be an injection of new stuff coming up from underneath, but some pressure change. And then that's what, what sends it up. So the thing is that, you know, if it goes up too slowly, that magma, that molten rock will just solidify. So actually, it does take quite a bit of oomph to get that stuff out. And I don't know if you've seen the images at the moment from Etna, mm -hmm. which is just my favourite volcano because it's this colossal volcano, but actually it doesn't really kill people. And the, the eruptions has been happening, the paroxysmal eruptions over the last few nights are just astonishing. So so I think the an answer to the question, I mean, you do get signs when, um, you know, lava flows out, and particularly in what's called effusive eruptions at like Hawaii and things like that, where the, the stuff is leaky and, and leaks out. But if but a lot of volcanoes, certainly the most spectacular ones, the classic cone-shaped ones, um, the stuff sits in the middle of it in these kind of complicated fracture systems as they depressurize, and then that's when the stuff, the stuff comes out. But volcanoes are so cool.
Right, so that's a good so for nine year olds, ten year olds, etc. Keep your questions coming yeah, in because no. very often, and it's something I've seen on tour so often, the questions where people think, Oh, this is just going to be all cute and charming, and then they go, Oh man, this is something we've it. been dealing with for a hundred years. I hear it when they say, oh, This is a really stupid question, but and you just know you start to sag already. <laughs> How could this four-year-old have such a deep understanding of dark energy and its possibilities if it does exist? Um, this is a question from uh, Gobbledygook Theatre. Well done for being called Gobbledygook Theatre. Gobbledygook's one of my favourite uh, uh, words. Uh, and Gobbledygook Theatre says, My favourite rock type is inferior oolite because it is so fossiliferous. Fossiliferous is that? I hope that's mm -hmm. that, that's right. Uh, and uh, but I'd like to, I'd love to know what each of the panel's favourite rocks are. So who do you, do you want to start, Angela? Is that okay? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm. That's a very good question, isn't it? Um, what have I got on my? I've got a couple on my desk to just kind of stimulate me. Uh, my favourite rock. I mean, mm, I was going to say chalk, but I've just talked about chalk. Um, I think it is chalk actually, and I'm going to hold it again because really it is it is such a remarkable rock and it looks super boring doesn't it because you're looking at it and thinking it's just a piece of white it's a it's a boring white rock it's my favorite rock because it's full of these billions of microscopic algae called coccolithopores and i think if you're able to look at them you know uh, in under a microscope they are so utterly beautiful and their skeletons make up this rock but the other thing that makes up this rock is their detritus or otherwise known as their poo so it, it's just that beautiful looking rock made up of dead microscopic organisms plus their poo. Who doesn't love a rock full of poo, right? Oh, don't worry, by the way, Helen, we've got another whale poo question for you as well. So we'll be keeping with this theme at one point. <laughs> I, I just want, I wanted to ask you, I'm trying to it remember Faraday, was it, who did the lecture on a piece of chalk? Uh, uh, it probably it was that sounds very royal institution 1860s yeah it was about 1850s 1860s and, and I think you know what you were just saying then John is such a fantastic because I was brought up in the Chilterns and I never you know knew that full I just you know it's fascinating to see so much chalk and badger sets where you see all the way that you know the chalk is dug into but that part of the story that you were saying which is the main part of the story also, as someone who has terrible dandruff and eczema as well, realising that what well, my geological, you know, interest that I will ultimately be of in, in millions of years is is, is <laughs> wonderful. Um, I, I might stop using that specialist shampoo. Um, Ian, what's your favourite rock? Ian, what's your favourite rock? Uh, just about the chalk. The thing that amazed me about the chalk is uh, before I go into it is the fact that actually you don't get much of it in the geological record. It's a relatively modern. Rock type, and yet when it comes in, you know that Cretaceous period that is so characteristic of southern uh, England. Actually, it happens all the way across Europe in large parts of the world. So you have this, you know, situation where the configuration of the oceans and, and the continents is such, and the temperature that it gives rise to this new rock type, and the climate change that it produces. All these these cockles suddenly kind of producing, you know, changes climate. So again, it's it's really an interesting event in geological time. But I'm going to choose for my favourite rock, the, the Rainy Chert, <laughs> which is so up in Aberdeenshire, there's a rock wall, a stone wall, that there were these lumps in. And it was farmers were basically uh, getting it there when they were ploughing their fields this stone would mess up the ploughs and they would just pick up these things and put it on the rock, on the, on the wall and they built these walls. And no one really knew what it was. It didn't outcrop, as we say, it didn't surface anywhere. It was just kind of buried. And then someone had a look at this thing and thought, I, it looks like there's kind of life and plants and things in there. And it turns out, so people looked at this and it turned out that this subsurface outcrop that was only kind of appearing through these um, bits and pieces was essentially, I think it's 430 million years old, but it's, it's not the first plants, but it's the first ecosystem. So you can see the stems of the plants, you can see the invertebrates, there's, there's early kind of fossils in it. So it's the first ecological community that's been preserved. And it's it was basically at a time when Aberdeenshire was full of active volcanoes and they were laying down these, it was almost like these, you know, if you think of New Zealand, you get these travertine flows and things like that. And they're, the algal mats where it traps the vegetation and kind of preserves them. Um, which I don't know if you've been to Aberdeen, but it's rather different today. Um, so I love the fact that the first ecosystem, complex ecosystem on the planet, is uh, about 10 miles west of Aberdeen in the Rainy Chair. And, the, and that unit, we still don't see it, just comes up as these 
yeah, the bits and pieces really, which is kind of nice too. I love everything so much. There. Uh, on stage that's uh i love Riney church by the way so just so you know how the book's going so far salacious ooze is uh a duplicitous slum landlord Riney church lives on the edge of town and people are very suspicious but actually turns up to be the hero of the book so we'll keep building this up uh yeah. helen can you give me a name for one of the characters in my 1983 <laughs> uh children's grotesque tale um well, um well i was going to pick manganese nodules which sit around on the bottom of the ocean were discovered uh, 150 years ago by challenger but since anjana has got us launched onto the poo topic which I'm regretting getting going on a year and a half ago. But, you know, let's continue. Um, I am going to pick my most surprising rock as being the very, uh, what makes up the very white beaches in the tropics that you see pictures of. Because um, what happens in those areas, everyone imagines those are very sort of luxurious beaches, but of course the way that they are formed is uh, there are fish, mostly parrotfish, which have these two kind of teeth things at the front and they eat by kind of scraping off like the coral that Ian was showing us before, they go around and kind of scrape off those and the matter that they contain. But then they've got all the stuff they want and then they've got a load of bits of coral that they don't want and they swim past you and they shed this little um, plume of white material uh, and that washes up and becomes the beautiful white beaches in the tropics. So if you have ever looked at a picture of beautiful white beaches in the tropics and wished you were there, I entirely encourage that uh, point of view. But do be aware that what you would be sitting on is parrotfish poop. Brilliant. There we go. Uh, that is, uh, you'll you know will. that you've made it even worse for yourself in the coming weeks. The questions you've broadened out the poo possibilities or uh, the poo possibilities. If we just save time on that, uh, the uh, just to mention, well, I've got another question that's just come in and. Uh, uh, mention again what's coming up that tomorrow if you're a patreon supporter at four o'clock uh, i'm doing a live interview with carlo Ravelli, um and also we've got the new episode of uh, tips for existence on tuesday with uh, astronaut engineer and artist uh, nicole stott and on friday we have a new episode of uncanny hour as well and i'm not sure who's going to be on, on book shambles this week but uncanny hour has Stuart lee and alan moore and clara nellish and various others uh ian paul would like to know because you're mentioning tsunamis and he said uh um do all earthquakes cause tsunamis it's just that they don't all reach the land land uh well no you need a certain size of earthquake rupturing the seafloor to generate the amount of i mean you would get a you would get a disturbance in the ocean you would certainly get that but really to, to make it um detectable it needs to be a certain size so many earthquakes you get earthquakes that don't even produce any kind of displacement on the grounds on the seabed surface because they're just not big enough so you definitely need a, a dislocation of the ground surface the only exception is and with the, this is a particular problem is you can have an earthquake that doesn't trigger the rupture of the seabed but it it's enough to destabilize the coastline so a slump a submarine slump and because that then produces a displacement in the sea, uh, the, the ocean column, that can produce a really big tsunami. It actually produces much bigger tsunamis in the sense that locally you can have tens of meter high waves. But what happens is they, they dissipate very quickly, so they don't travel across great oceans. Um, but you can get situations where, well, the Tuya Bay in Alaska in the, in the 60s, it was a 500 meter high wave. That, that trashed a, a, an inlet and actually wasn't even noticed in the, the inlets on either side. So you can get really big tsunamis and that was a relatively small earthquake that caused the rock slide into a very narrow field, if you like, producing that. So it's kind of tricky because you can have, I mean, you'll see it all the time, you had an earthquake, there was one last week in, uh, in kind of the Western Pacific, really big earthquakes, but they don't necessarily produce a tsunami and then you, uh, because you've not had enough displacement and then you can get you know a relatively small earthquake that doesn't change the seabed but produces a landslide produces a big tsunami so it's a bit of a, a bit of a tricky one that one Oh, thanks very much. Thank you for your question, Paul. Um, uh, so, James, I don't know if you're okay. We'll start with this. This is quite a specific one. I was watching a documentary recently on Amazon about the cave crystals in Mexico, and the scientists featured there said there were still a lot of un unanswered questions about how it was formed. The documentary was made in 2005. Have we learned more over the last 16 years? Oh, I, I don't know. Ooh, I, don't I, really I, I don't know. I don't really work in this field. So, um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think geology is such an evolving science and I and I think with that discovery and I think I know the cave that they're talking about Ian didn't you do a program there? yeah I, I went there once it's it's an amazing place we we filmed in this 
Angela, I don't want to take over your question. That's no, no, that's fine. It's it's just not my area of expertise. But I mean, I mean, what what I would say is is there's plenty out there to discover. And I think, as we all know, science is an evolving subject. And even if you're four years old and you're asking Ian all about volcanoes and how where, where the lavas can go into where the lava flows can go into rivers, I think it's important for anybody out there to know that science is evolving. We haven't answered all of those questions, and there's an opportunity for everybody to have uh, an input into how how our ideas develop, if you like. Mm. But coming back to crystals, Ian, because that's more your well. well. Yeah, I mean, the, those crystals are gypsum uh, plaster of Paris. You know, they're the most boring. Well, not boring. You're going to get loads of <laughs> messages. We almost got a geologist. A geologist said the rock might be boring. Almost. Yeah. almost <laughs> did it. But, you know, they're very commonplace minerals, but they are like 20, 30 meters, an astonishing place. And um, so we, we filmed, and they were with a second crew in after the National Geographic, they had a whole one hour, and they call it the Cave of Death. <laughs> and uh, and it, it's quite a toxic place because it's very high, hundred percent humidity. Uh, and but what was interesting was, um, I think it's all closed now because they they had breached it and they discovered this place. But it's actually a mine, a, a tin mine, and so the tin and, and silver. And the problem was that they were trying to keep this place going, um, but the mine was barely making even, barely breaking even. And so what I think they did after a year or so after we filmed there, is they closed it up and they let it flood. So I don't, the last I heard, I don't think you can go in. But I think, go back to the question, I mean, it's really difficult to know why you get such huge crystals and what the conditions were. And, and I don't think we have solved that because we, we haven't really studied. But I kind of like the fact that it's now been closed back in again in a way, you know. So many of the amazing places we then explore and examine and all the rest of it, and we almost know too much about them that we lose the poetry and the all and all of that kind of stuff that i think we need to kind of keep keep preserved a little bit call me old-fashioned wonderful thank you yeah i mean calling a geologist old-fashioned but then again when you really when you talk to theoretical physicists i mean they're going back billions now it's ridiculous uh now i i can't wait any longer helen lisa's question has been here i think now for five weeks i think waiting almost as long as dean so i hope you don't have a full answer as well so lisa will stay with us uh her question is what is the difference between shark poo and whale poo and the role it plays in the ocean and she does say this is a serious question she's genuinely interested in this OK, so, um, well, sharks have a different sort of digestive system. Whales are mammals, sharks are fish. So, so there's a few differences in the um, number of holes and where things come out. But anyway, the, the, so the, interest, the, the thing about whale poo that is interesting is that they, they feed at, at some depth, not always a huge amount of depth, like a sperm whale. They can feed close to the surface, but they feed away from the surface a little bit. But they always poo at the surface. So a whale is always bringing nutrients from lower down to higher up. Um, sharks don't have to breathe air because they're fish so they don't have to come back up to the surface to poo so although there are studies showing that um sharks the sharks kind of might do this sideways that they feed out in the open ocean they feed on pelagic fish so big schools of fish out in the open ocean and maybe they bring that into coral reefs and pooing near the coral reefs then can fertilize the reefs i think that's quite early i don't know what what proportion of i don't think sharks are doing it deliberately they're not using the coral reefs as a toilet but in this case it would be quite helpful for the reef quite often if they did so um and also obviously there are sharks that eat mostly uh some similar things to some of the things whales eat right phytoplankton tiny they they great they sort of filter feed tiny organisms and then there are sharks that go out biting things uh, and obviously they produce different sorts of poo my sister asked me yesterday why why dog poo wasn't used as infertilized like horse poo but anyway that's a separate question um so so i think so i think that sh firstly sharks are the most important thing in the ocean is vertical mixing can you get things from down there to up here and that is basically the constraint on the entire ocean ecosystem is can you get what's down below up to the top so whales specifically help in that process sharks might only help that in a sideways way they might help fertilizing reefs in some situations but they don't play the same game of mixing things that have escaped back up to where the sunlight is so that's about the it's probably more on that that's the limit of what i know about whale poo and shark poo sorry that just made me think though in, in, in terms of it in 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 farming etc in agriculture generally uh, are, is any form of manure used that is uh comes from an animal that is is predominantly uh, carnivorous 
So that was my answer to my sister, that I think the difference is that dogs are carnivorous, although hers appears to eat carrots. Um, so it's not the most carnivorous dog at the moment. So maybe it, maybe it is producing potential. Go she said it's making a lot of it. So if I want any, then I can have some for my plants. Um, it's like a millennial dog, isn't it? It's like a vegan dog. <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently this isn't uncommon when they're teething. I'm not an expert on eating carrots. I can see so many research proposals here. <laughs> Do you know what? If you do this carrot thing, Helen, as your next research, I think it will get you out of all of this trouble you've got with the beekeepers. So just see how that works. But that, yeah, that's uh, having been in, in Cambridge when in the farms just outside they put all the kind of chicken silage on and the stink then. Should it then move up to dog excrement? I'm not keen. I'm not keen. That's what I'm going to say. It has to be well rotted. Whatever you do, it has to be well rotted because otherwise the ammonia will destroy everything. Oh. Do not go putting fresh poo from any animal on your garden unless you want to kill everything okay good that's a, a, a upbeat take on manure uh this is now i better get to it ross wanted to know and i don't think it's ross noble who was on the monkey cage panel but i'm going to ask you all of this uh it's still uncertain is it really true as i mentioned in the introduction that geologists out in the field may well eat or lick rocks <laughs> who wants to start on that yeah, I'll start on it because I, I'll I, start on it because I was, I, I did it and I kept on getting tore off. In fact, when I did my first series and I, I did it and I just did it because that's what we do, I, I was lots of viewers' comments, uh, including from some people, H, health and safety people saying you shouldn't do it. And, and I started thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't do it, but I was taught to do it as well. Um, yeah, bite, the other one's baiting, you know, in terms of the crystal, how crystalline, if it's us to try and get the fraction, the sediment, the size fraction. And generally, that's not good for your teeth as well. So there's quite a few of these practices. It's probably not very good for us. But they, yeah. They... What are you tasting for when you're when you're tasting rock? Well, it's more. I think it's more. And and John is probably a better guide than us. I think it's more the actual sediment size than something to do with minerals. I think it's a. It. Is it gritty? Is it fine? Yeah. Is it silty? You're kind of doing that. But of course, yeah. yeah if it's silica, it's it's pretty strong in your uh, in your yeah. teeth. I mean, I was always taught that, you know, silk had that soapy texture between your teeth and you'd, you'd kind of pick a bit up and you'd, you'd kind of put it in your teeth and just kind of grind it around. It's absolutely great grain size. That's why you're doing it. That's why you're kind of grinding it in your teeth. And and you can see how white my teeth are. So silk. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'd, I, I don't know if I'd recommend it, but it's, it's what you were taught, wasn't it? It's, yeah, no, absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's very interesting, but we will not take any responsibility for anyone who now goes out and does this and has any uh, dental damage. Uh, this is, um, I think I'm going to throw this one initially at you, Helen, but please, anyone else, if they, they were. Actually, no, I'm going to change the question. We will still get to your question, Francis, but I thought this was interesting. Talking before about kind of continental drift and those ideas quite early on the show, Mr. G was interested in knowing how long it would take for the basic map of the world to be so different that it would feel inaccurate. That to, to actually, if you looked at a globe, to actually go, it, it's now too far away from 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 this image. So, and John, do you want to talk on that or Ian? I, well, and, well, yeah. I, I mean, I would say. I, I mean, I would say. I don't, I don't know. A couple of hundreds of millions of years. I don't know. I'm thinking of Pangaea and how long. When we look at the breakup of Pangaea, and we're talking what between three to five hundred million years. I don't know. I'm going to kind of go with something like that based on the breakup of Pangaea. What do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the but you can get these models. If you go on, there's a, a, a guy called, well, there's a few of them now, but there's a guy called Chris Scottese who does these reconstructions backwards, but he does a, a forward one, and he reckons in 250 million years there'll be a new supercontinent. He shows what it's like. In terms of where you'd see the first action I, I suspect the first big change you would see is in the so australia is the fastest moving continent ironically with you know a, a continent without really earthquakes and plate boundaries and volcanoes but it's really fast moving and that is already colliding into the the, the southeastern edge of indonesia um so flores and some of those places so the first thing i think you'd see is the welding really of australia with the the uh, indonesian kind of archipelago um but yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. Yeah. I think there's possibly an interesting add-on, isn't there, which is that sea level rise is probably going to trickier than geology. And there are, I, I did actually look a few years ago into seeing if I could get inflatable globes made with different levels of sea level rise. Um, and it turns out it's very hard to get people to custom print inflatable globes. But I think it's a bit depressing, but it's a bit quicker than 250 million yeah, years. Yeah. 
But the, the interesting thing there is, uh, quite often you're involved in a project where they say, what we want to do is to show them up with sea level rise, particularly, right. a, sea, particularly a sea level rise in 100 years. And so they do the reconstruction, you don't see don't see any change and they say oh okay well let's imagine that you know in 200 years and again like if it's the uk maybe the wash or something like it's a little bit more and then through desperation the producers will melt the whole of the antarctic ice sheet and then you get something looking very very different but but you're absolutely right i think geologically it will be sea level that's the the main driver of of you know, that changing the geography did you want to add something to that as well I was surprised that no one mentioned. I was surprised that no one mentioned Brexit and the uh, impact uh, that would have on us rejoining the European Union. Uh, we get so little politics on this. It's nice to get it every now and again. Um, the uh, I think most people will probably be in agreement there. Uh, this is, uh, I just mentioned we've got one final question now. I mentioned again tomorrow, 4 p.m., Carlo Ravelli. Uh, if you can support us for our Patreon, that's fantastic. We have new books. Uh, Selena Godden, by the way, it's the last episode of the book show. It's the one we just did with Josie Long. If you Selena Godden's book, Mrs. Death, M- Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death, is one of just, it's a, a, a a book of utter beauty and sadness and it's wonderful we we talked to her so that's up at the moment and this week's book shambles will be uh mark Steele and natalie haynes talking about jeremy hardy uh and the book that was posthumously brought out of uh of, of his work so that's a, a few more of those things that are on on now and uh now francis's question um helen i'll start with you on this i think which is francis read an article in the guardian yesterday saying the atlantic ocean circulation that underpins the gulf stream the weather system that brings warm and mild weather to europe is at its weakest in more than a millennium This seems to be bad news. I wondered if Helen and the panel might be able to talk about this in just a bit more detail. So, so Helen, would you like to add to this? Yeah, now I get to be embarrassed embarrassed here for two reasons. Because first of all, um, the reason that paper got written is because someone I was at university with who's a journalist talked to someone I was at university with who is a geologist at UCL. And uh, he's talked to me about quite a lot. So when I saw the story come out and I saw the two of them tweeting about it, I put it in my, oh, I really need to read that. Um, But I didn't get around to it. So, but basically, Basically, the, the reason the reason it might matter is because um, uh, so I haven't read the details of this paper. Like David Thornalley, who uh, was the lead author on this, has written a lot of he, this is what his research is. So I don't know which I think Tom was going back to an article from some, from t- some time ago. But um, the basic principle is that the ocean regulates heat distribution on Earth and the uh North Atlantic drift is a part, a massive part of that heat regulation. It's not just bringing warm water around, but it's influencing the speed at which um, brine forms and therefore at which cold water sinks close to the Arctic to form deep water. So there's this kind of vertical overturning circulation and um, the uh, heat exchange at the surface basically controls that process. And so I don't think David's that worried about uh, the North Atlantic drift slowing down. In fact, he's told me in the past that he was quite cross about um, people overblowing that possibility because it's a really slow process. And there's a lot of other things that have to matter first before you get, you know, before it shuts off and really causes problems. Um, it's also linked to the input of fresh water from land. So if ice melts, you get more more of an input of fresh water and that changes the buoyancy of the water at the Arctic and that changes its overturning circulation. So, I don't think there's enough evidence to say it's something to worry about yet. But I think there's a bigger picture here, which is that it's not about the North Atlantic drift. Like the big picture of climate change is that Earth is effectively a closed system. Energy comes into it from the sun. Energy leaves via radiation. And the amount of energy in the system is increasing with time because of carbon dioxide. So uh, that's what climate change is. There's more energy in the system. And what that does is it changes the patterns. It changes the patterns of the engine. It changes exactly where you get circulation and where water goes up and down. And the problem with that is not a problem for the Earth because the Earth is perfectly happy. This has all changed lots, you know, as we heard with continental plates drifting, this has changed lots over time already. The reason it matters is that our lives now, our infrastructure relies on those patterns being as they are. And it assumes that they are only going to change on geological timescales. And if they change more quickly, then we've got a problem. So actually, I think that the the actual point of this is not whether the North Atlantic drift is slowing in a significant way or not. It's the global pattern. You shove more energy into your engine and then your energy, your engine works a bit differently. Things get a bit slower here a bit faster there they rotate a bit more quickly over there and that changes the pattern of the way you know where it rains where it where there's drought how the rivers go all of that kind of stuff and so and and we are very wedded to it being as it is now and so that's the bigger picture i think more than it just being about the north atlantic drift now 
Thank you, Helen. We're out of time now, so I'm just going to quickly find out. Um, Ian, is there anything people should be looking out for from uh, that's coming out from you uh, in the near future? No. <laughs> no. Brilliant. There we go. That saves people a lot of time. Some of Ian's previous books, some old, before he got lazy, uh, he used to, you know, there's all manner of stuff that came out. No, I've shifted. I'm, I'm doing some interesting stuff in the academic world and uh, in, I've moved kind of move it across the job and doing some stuff there, there but, but, uh, so I'm kind of excited about all that but not necessarily in the telly and media world but thanks and, for thinking of me though no, we do worry. We worry about you. And the uh, he choked on a pebble again. He chewed too hard. Um, and John, what about you? Is there, is there stuff we should be looking out for? You? Is, there, is there stuff we should be looking out for at the moment? Uh, I'll be on a series uh, called Treasures Decoded. On I think it's on Channel Five. And I'll, bizarrely, I'll be talking about uh, the impact of sea level rise on on underwater archaeology. So I'm not sure when that's coming out, but it's just a little piece there where I'm talking about that. So. OK, people will keep an eye out for that. And uh, I was just if, the episode of Mastermind that I was on goes out next Saturday. We're just waiting for confirmation of that on Sunday night uh, because my specialist subject was the young ones. Uh, hopefully, yeah. Josie Long and I are going to do a, uh, a a young ones quiz and a Rick Mail quiz uh, next Sunday, uh, as well as all the other stuff in between. And if anyone wants to come and join in that. But of course, first of all, next Sunday, before all that happens at 3 p.m., we'll be back uh, with another Sunday Science Q&A. Keep an eye on social media. I'm not entirely sure what uh, next week's subject is going to be. Or it might be quite a broad one. We might just do a general one next week. But uh, thank you. Oh, no. Do you know what? I was all jolly there. I was doing all the jolly face. And I've just heard in my ear what we are doing next week. It's going to be COVID. Um, but that said, there is, I mean, you know, it has been an incredible for that, those people who watched the first Q&A that we did about this probably at the end of April last year. And you compare what was being said then in terms of our understanding with the understanding that's happened. It is an incredible story of science as well and i hope you'll join join us for that panel we always have wonderful people who are very often at the forefront of research and and please do keep up to date with it there are still i know probably not people watching this but get ready there's, there's still so many people doctors and nurses and hospital workers who not only are at the forefront of an extremely difficult situation uh which in terms of for mental health for just mere sanity is difficult but they're having to deal with all manner of stuff which i am frankly going to say is, is crack pottery which is making their lives more and more difficult so that's one of the reasons we need to stay on top of, of understanding what we should know so join us for that uh for the covid panel next week and then we will have uh lighter moments later on that evening hopefully with a quiz about rick and the young ones thank you to our producer Trent Burton thank you to our patron supporters and thank you to all of you who watch bye-bye <laughs>